case they want. Tell me, or any ideas, why do we have a resolution in the first place? Right. So every year, the debate leagues release resolutions. They vote on resolutions, and that's the resolution that they're going to use for the year. Everyone has to use that resolution if you're going to debate that type of debate. But why would they do this if it doesn't serve a purpose? Well, it does. See, resolutions are important because they limit debate. So resolutions... Um, Resolutions have really one concern, and that's fairness. That is through limitations. Um, but a resolution exists because, imagine if you didn't have one. Imagine if team policy debate was debate about any policy. Well, someone could either, number one, come up with a policy that you had never heard of whatsoever and just bring it into the round, and you're, you're done, because you don't know anything, and you can't talk about it. In debate, we do research. We research both sides, and as the negative, you kind of know what cases are out there, because we have a general topic area, and so you are prepared. But the other reason, besides cases that no one knows about, is cases that are abusive. So, for instance, in a Christian league, if someone were to run to abolish abortions or something like that, something that almost everyone in that room would agree with, everyone in the league, it's an abusive case. So what we do is we try to define resolutions that don't allow you to make any abusive cases, and that's what the debate league does, and that's the reason they have resolutions, is so they can have defined areas of debate that people can abuse. So... With that in mind, there are two impacts of topicality, two reasons we care whether or not someone is falling under the resolution that they're given for the year. The first is debate itself, debate undermined. So the affirmative has one spoken duty, both spoken and unspoken. The affirmative has to bring a case that's under the resolution. It's kind of the official rules of debate, kind of. Again, debate is debatable, and so topicality is completely debatable too. But when we have a resolution, that means that it's a debate topic for the year. And there are a number of reasons that it undermines debate itself when someone isn't topical. It violates your ground because you were preparing for this topic and they brought something that wasn't under this topic at all. It violates the intent of debate or the educational value of debate, which in turn leads to undermining debate and the activity itself. The second reason we care, and the reason that judges are probably going to latch on more, is reality. You see, judges like to hear something real. Theory, if you talk about this, bores people. I mean, people just kind of sit there with a blank stare, and they're like, so it's not fair to you. Cool story, bro. Tell it again. You know, and so when you talk about reality and we put this in a real context, it makes much more sense to the judges. So... I have up here the example of Congress. Congress actually does this. When Congress talks about bills, no one congressman can be an expert in everything at the same time. I mean, that's unreasonable. So they divide Congress into different committees to discuss bills before they go to the floor. And these committees have different headings. So we have the Foreign Affairs Committee, Agricultural Committee. They only talk about things that go to their committee, that are supposed to be their committee. If a bill goes to that committee, that doesn't fit under that committee, it's immediately reassigned because it's not what they're supposed to be talking about. So, for instance, an energy bill is brought to the Veterans Affairs Committee. Everyone's like, that's a mistake. That's not supposed to happen. And they send it off. So topicality has real-world impacts. What it does is it degrades discussion, it degrades debate, and it kind of takes apart what we're trying to do with debate itself. So, um, 
just real world, I want, I want to give you like a grasp of topicality. So we have Middle East um, electronic surveillance law. That is, do you have an example of a case that would be non-topical? Okay, so they want to reform. The case is to, I don't know. They have people spying on ball games from the, the the roofs of houses around, and they want to ban um, Secret Service from spying on private stadiums like that. Okay, um, you say no, this isn't topical. Okay, and we go back to your structure of topicality. Why? Because here's what the definition of electronic is. The interpretation is it has to be something that's electronic. It has to fit these certain standards. The violation, the reason it doesn't fit under that is because they're using people. Now the person may be using a binocular, but you have to have a person right there to be standing and to be looking in at the stadium. And the impact. The impact is debate undermined first. Basically, it violates fairness. It violates our ground. We studied about electronic surveillance. And they came up here, and they talked about something that had to do with people standing with binoculars. And we had absolutely no idea that was going to happen. If you get too long in that tangent, it sounds a little whiny to your judge. So then you move on to the second one. In Congress, if this happened, we wouldn't be debating this. We'd take this proposal, this plan, and we'd throw it out in some other committee. Because that's what we do. That's what normal people do. So does anyone have any questions about topicality? Okay, Topicality is one of those arguments. Um, it's important. So when we talk about prima facie, which is another fancy term, it just means it's the most important argument. If someone's non-topical, like blatantly non-topical, then you realize, yeah, it's really important. Because you can take something, and sometimes people are fishy, then you can make a topicality argument. But if someone is blatantly, so for instance, if they're reforming policy towards Cuba under the Middle East resolution, you know, boom, you're going to beat them right there on topicality. You're going to tell the judge, you're going to tell the judge why it matters, and you've already won the debate because they're not debating the debate. But most of the time, topicality is going to make people mad, especially where it's kind of fishy. So um, you say, this is... Uh, not exactly reforming, because reform means to change something, and you're making something new, which means that, uh, yeah, don't do that. It's not going to make anyone happy. <laughs> okay, let's talk about inherency. Inherency is the second of our stock issues. You can breathe it, I and H. Inherency is facts. Translate the word, put it in Google Translate. Inherency translates to facts. That's what you need to understand about inherency. But inherency has a little bit more to it. And you can ask the question what is happening in the status quo? Or the mess we're in, as you know. Um, the substitution for this could be the current system or the current world. So, in at that. Inherency is the stock issue of the world of today, of the status quo. And it includes stuff in the past, what has happened before, its historical examples, and the present world. So if you disagree about the facts or have facts to add, this is where you do it. If you want to make an inherency argument against someone's case, against someone's, um, someone's structure, whatever the debate is, then you do it under an inherency argument. So, for instance, the case to stop the binocular surveillance sounds like a really dumb idea. You know it's a really dumb idea because the government abolished it last month. And apparently the affirmative hasn't heard about this. But I'm sorry, we don't need to pass this because we already have. So you've already defeated it. You, ha you don't need to vote for the policy because the policy has already happened. You see? It's a very easy way to do inherency. But inherency is more than that, because inherency can be simply setting up facts. So if you were to say, um, I feel like I have to use examples from last year to actually um, look at this. But inherency looks at the um, facts, and it looks at, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be an argument. So you make an inherency point, you can set something up. So for instance, I, I want to, there's, there's cases last year 
that looked at different ways of reforming election law, right? And so election law had things that you had to establish. Um, let's say the case was gerrymandering reform. Um, anyone familiar with what gerrymandering is? Okay, gerrymandering is basically when politicians take the lines of districts and then redraw them for political use. So a lot of people had cases trying to reform this. They said that um, basically politicians are misusing the process and so we need to keep these politicians accountable by using an independent commission or a computer algorithm or whatever the case was. So inherency could look at a number of things. You could have your inherency argument against this case and you could say first of all a number of states have systems already and states have the ability. That could be your second argument. States have the ability. Then you could agree on the facts. So I'll move to significance in a, in, a, in a second, but you could also say, yes, gerrymandering is happening in some instances. And I'll show again a different type of argument, significance, that would look at that. But inherency also looks at root causes. Root causes, and that's important to understand. Um, root causes is basically the idea of what, um, if you chase things down the line, what is the real cause of the problem? And that could be an inherency argument. So for instance, we're talking about gerrymandering. I could disagree. Um, they could say that their harm could be political polarization, right? That could be the problem in the system. And they say that gerrymandering is causing that. I say the root cause isn't gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is a side effect, a symptom, right? You fix gerrymandering, nothing's going to happen. So an inherency argument can look at political corruption. It could look at the culture of the government. It could look at all the different things that cause it, money. It could look at the funding of political campaigns. Anything you think causes that issue instead is an inherency argument. So an inherency is sort of a bridge to other arguments, but it sets up what you think to be true in the system. And that's when you understand about inherency. Now, oh yeah, I have an example. The problem is violence in Syria. The affirmative says it's an energy crisis that's causing it. Well, you could disagree. You could say that the violence is the fault of deep-rooted religious sectarianism. It's the fault of their belief system, not some other external thing. The energy crisis and the crash of the economy and all that stuff is side effects of what's really happening. And until you stop that belief system, which you can't, by the way, you will not be able to have a lasting solution, which is a solvency argument, and we'll talk about that. But inherency is the, is the bridge to solvency. Now let's look at significance. Significance is why. Significance is your impact. Claim, warrant, impact. Significance, impact. Significance is every reason you matter, your argument matters, and every reason you should be in here in your debate round, is telling why your side all fun falls under this stock issue. Now, significance is not arguing a problem is small. It's a common misconception. A lot of people say, significance. Well, significant. Your plan isn't significant enough to pass. Therefore, we shouldn't pass it, right? Not necessarily. Significance topicality is a type. Now, if you recall in the resolutions, we have a, um, we have words like significant. The United States should significantly reform its policy towards the Middle East or significantly reform its electronic surveillance law. If you say that the policy isn't too small, isn't, isn't big enough to pass, then that would be a top count argument. Do you see what I'm talking about a little bit? Here's an example. Um, so the United States has significantly reformed its policy to one or more countries in the Middle East. Um, if, oh, I'm not moving it. If you were to give a dollar or more to Israel in aid, maybe people might think that's a great policy, but it's a dollar. The fact is that your resolution states explicitly that you should significantly reform its policy towards the Middle East. So that's the reason that exists. That type of argument, you say it's not topical because it's not significant, and therefore it shouldn't be accepted. Now, do you kind of see the use of that? 
there could be a lot of cases where someone is moving one thing or changing policy towards one person or by X amount of dollars. And that could really harm your debate. That could really harm what you're trying to talk about and just make it a lot more annoying and harder for everyone. And that's the type of argument that sometimes are used. But significance itself is all about impacts. Significance equals the impact. So when you have a disagreement about um, what is happening or if something is bad or not, that's a significant argument. So if you were to say that um, we were using gerrymandering, right? If you were to you say that gerrymandering is bad, for instance, that's what the affirmative says. They come up there and say, this.